Hello students, so today we are going to uh, study and learn about uh, insurance contract. Last class we learned about what is insurable interest, what are the types of risks that an insurance company will be able to cover, like pure risks and so on. And today we're going to learn what is an insurance contract. We're going to learn it in the international perspective. We're going to also go through, the, uh, through chapter six, where um, we're going to learn about um, how an insured or how an insured party can file a claim, what is the procedure involved there, and what, what really takes place while filing a claim. So let's move on directly to our slides. Okay, so in international perspective, we are going to refer to the laws that are available across the globe. Some of the countries, of course, we cannot go through all the countries where uh, managed to refer to the laws of Spain, UK, India, and so on. So what is this insurance contract? Insurance contract is a contract between the insurer and the insured. I'm sure you know this. We've already learned it uh, for the past four classes. What is an insurance contract? Uh, contract and who are the parties to the insurance contract. So insurance contract is a contract between the insurer and the insured. So you know who is the insurer that is the one who insures that is the insurance company and who is the insured the party who is insured also could be the policy holder the one who actually procures the policy or purchases the policy. The insurer undertakes to pay comp or compensate the loss that has occurred that or the loss or the damage that has occurred to the party who has sought the insurance and is covered under the insurance. So the party who obtains and or is covered under the insurance policy contract is insured and the insured is expected to pay a fixed amount of money on the happening of a certain event. Now, if you understand the concept of just contract, what is a contract? A contract is an agreement that is enforceable in law. And in an agreement, there have to be, uh, you know, an offer and acceptance. An offer along with acceptance is considered as, as an agreement. And that agreement, which is enforceable in law, the enforceability part of it attached to the agreement is called as a contract. Now, the enforceability part of it, so how would you determine enforceability? Of course, the parties must be, uh, you know, capable of contracting. There has to be capacity to contract. The person should not be a minor. The person should not be insane, should not, you know, contract under a drunken state and so on. So capacity to contract. A person should not contract under, uh, you know, uh, under pressure, uh, under undue influence, under coercion, misrepresentation and so on. So misrepresentation also is a very discouraging factor in an insurance contract so normally even in a normal contract it's a very uh, you know a, a factor which is highly demotivating and it will not be considered as a valid contract in case any contract is signed under misrepresentation or you know where the party has not uh, where the right party has not been represented and there has been a misrepresentation and so on so the normal aspects of contract would be applicable even to insurance contracts insurance contract is a type of a special contract than the normal commercial contracts it is also called as indemnity contract however uh, the, only the life uh, insurance policy contract is like distinct from the other commercial insurance contracts because the, the, the difference between the other commercial contracts and life insurance policy contract is that life insurance policy is not uh, really, you know, it, it, it cannot really ascertain the loss or the damage clearly. It is, um, you know, it's not really calculable. So therefore, it does not come under, uh, you know, an indemnity contract. Well, of course, it's an insurance contract. You have personal uh, insurance contract and it comes under, I mean, it is a life insurance co uh, policy contract and so on. Now, having understood what is a contract that is an agreement is enforceable in law, the normal contract definition is applicable even for insurance, uh, you know, contract. And it's just that where there is a party, 
uh, who is the insurer, the one who agrees to insure the other party and agrees to indemnify the loss of the other party or cover the losses or pay the amount, uh, whatever, pay the amount, whatever uh, is due to the other party upon maturity. So like, for example, life insurance policy, the amount is paid upon maturity or upon the happening of an event that is the death of a person. So uh, likewise, in the other type of contracts, the other commercial contracts, the amount will be disbursed when a particular event happens. So it, it, it depends upon a particular contingency and then the amount will be, uh, you know, it will be disbursed. So therefore here, simply speaking, in an insurance contract, you know that there are two parties. Basically, one is the insurance company, the other is the policyholder or the insured. The insurance company is also called as the insurer, the one who insures. The policyholder is also called as an insured or there will be another, you know, party called as insured because sometimes uh, you know, for example, a company, a company will insure, uh, will take a, a you know, a, a comprehensive insurance policy and cover all the workers. So the workers altogether are, uh, you know, insured parties. Are you understanding me? But who is insuring? Who is procuring the insurance? Part, uh, insurance uh, is actually the company. So the party who obtains or is covered under the insurance policy contract is the insured, and the insured is expected to pay a fixed amount of money. Uh, periodically in the in a, and it is called as premiums now referring to the law in spain let us see what the law in spain or the spanish law talks about uh you know uh, the insurance contract article one of uh, law 50 bar 1980 defines insurance contract as a contract of insurance uh, that is by virtue of which the insurer agrees for a specific consideration that is premium because as you know, in a contract, there has to be a valid consideration. So likewise, they have you know, uh, adopted uh, a, a similar definition here, but just applied it to the concept of insurance. They say that a contract of insurance is a contract by virtue of which the insurer agrees for a specified consideration that is premium. And when an event occurs, the risk of which is the object of coverage, to indemnify within the agreed limits the damage suffered by the insured or to pay a capital sum, a rent or other agreed compensation. So this is what the law in Spain says under Article 1 of the, uh, of the insurance law in Spain. Now, referring to the law in UK, there is no statutory definition available as yet of insurance contract. However, in the case of Prudential versus Commissioners of Inland Revenue, 1904, the King's, ben uh, uh, King's Bench case, where there was Justice Channel who referred to an insurance contract and observed that, namely a contract whereby one party, that is the insurer, promises in return for a money consideration, the premium, to pay the other party, the insured, a sum of money or to provide him with a corresponding benefit upon the occurrence of one or more specified events. Now, this is what the uh, this is the definition that is given by Lord Chanel uh, in one of the cases that is Prudential versus Commissioner of Inland Revenue. Next is the Finnish law, that is uh, to the law in Finland. Under the Finnish civil law, insurance contract is said to be based on an agreement or a contract between the insurance company and the policyholder. After the conclusion of the insurance contract, the insurance company is to transfer the insurance policy to the policyholder. The insurance policy document should contain the most relevant points of the insurance contract and the terms of the policy and all other requirements stipulated in the Finnish Insurance Contract Act. So this is what is the definition that is given under the Finnish law or the law in Finland. Next reference to the law in Greece. Let's see what the Greek law says now. Article 1 of law 2496 by 97, it states that by the insurance contract and insurance uh, undertaking, there's an undertaking by whom? By the insurer that he undertakes to make payments or if specifically agreed to make provision in kind to the other party that is a policyholder or to the third party in return for a premium on the occurrence of the event on which it has been agreed that the insurance uh, insurer's obligation depends, that is the insured event. That means there is an event that would, is apprehended to take place. And so 
they cover up that particular event and the insurance obligation, you know, uh, it, it is triggered on the happening of that particular event. So here they say there is an insurer, there's an insurer, there's an event that is covered. And for that, a premium is paid by the policy holder or by, uh, you know, by the insured. And the obligation of the, you know, the insurer is triggered on the happening of that particular event. So now the law in Germany, Article 1 Insurance Contract Act deals with the main obligations of both the parties. By making a contract of insurance, the insurer undertakes to cover a certain risk of the policyholder or a third party by paying a definite by paying a benefit up to the date on the occurrence of the agreed insured event. So this is how they're given definition under Article 1 of the Insurance Contract Act in Germany. Now, referring to the law in India, in India, the definition attributed to an insurance contract is of the definition of a contract, which is under the Indian Contract Act. And the most simplest definition under the Indian Contract Act in 1872 is um, a contract you know, or, or an agreement which is enforceable in law is a contract. An agreement which is enforceable in law is a contract. So they have attributed the same definition, the properties of the same definition and attached it to the concept of insurance. And they say that an insurance agreement between the insurer and the insured that is enforceable by law is an insurance contract. Now the enforceability part of it. Now, as I said earlier, what is an enforceable contract? The elements of uh, enforce how what gives validity to a contract how is the contract enforceable so it has to have certain elements such as consideration is a is an essential element of a valid contract or capacity of the parties to the contract is taken into consideration or consent that is given in a contract that is it should be a valid consent and not under coercion duress or there has to be no misrepresentation and so on next the primary law that governs insurance in India is Insurance Act 1938, the Insurance Act and the Insurance Regulatory and Development Authority Act 1999. It's also called as the IRDA Act. Next, we have the reference to the law in the United Arab Emirates, UAE. Insurance contracts are governed by the UAE Federal Laws Number no. 5, 1985, the Civil Code, that we call it here, and the primary legislation on the establishment of regulation of insurance organization and activities is number no. 6 of 2007, the insurance law. Now, here in UAE, procuring a contract of insurance without an insurable interest, that we, you remember, we learned the concept uh, in the last class, insurable interest. So, without the concept of insurable interest is haram or it is actually prohibited under the Sharia law. So procuring a contract of insurance in UAE when sans insurable interest or without insurable interest is haram or prohibited under the Sharia law. However, the concept of insurable interest is not clearly defined in the law itself. That is the law I'm talking about is 5 of 85 and 6 of 2007. However, there is a mention of it in the commercial maritime law of UAE, which expressly prohibits anyone from benefiting from an insurance policy unless there is a lawful interest in the subject matter of the policy. That means this reference can be extended even to the other insurance policies. So by and large, there has to be an insurable interest. So this is normally a, a, a you know a principle that uh, you know revolves around the, the the law of insurance and a party who uh, you know seeks the insurance policy has to have an insurable interest to the the subject matter of the insurance policy. A reference to the Sultanate of Oman or the Omani law. The, in Oman, insurance contracts operate as a contract of adhesion. What is a contract of adhesion? You'll understand. Contract of adhesion is a, is a contract which is normally not really negotiable in nature, where now, you know, talking about insurance as a contract of adhesion, where the insured is bound by the terms and conditions that are set forth in the insurance policy contract by the insurer. So normally it's not really negotiable in nature. There is less or no scope for negotiation here. So insurance contracts cannot be easily terminated by the insurer unless there is an order from the code of law to that effect. So this is, you know, a, a, a really striking feature uh, in the laws of Oman that, uh, you know, uh, of course, it is, you know, prima facie a direct uh, contract of adhesion 
end, the insurer cannot run away from his obligations and he cannot really terminate his contract unless there is an order from the court of law to that effect. So this is a kind of a beneficial legislation, a beneficial law that is you know, operating in Oman. So this was held in one of the cases about, you know, sticking to the obligation and not uh, really, you cannot terminate, uh, the, the, the insurer cannot really terminate the contract unless he has a relevant order or, a, you know, a order to that effect from the court of law. Therefore, in the words of the, you know, as, as extracted from the judgment, it is not possible for the insurer to negate his obligation to cover the insured risk unless a specific judgment to that effect was issued by the court. So it does not depend upon the entire decision of the insurance company or the insurer to really terminate the contract, but it has to be fortified by, uh, you know, an order from the court of law. This is basically for them not to, uh, you know, avoid, uh, uh, you know, the obligation and the rights of the insured should not be really be displaced. Thereby, an insurance contract is a special contract that has elements. So this is what you really surmise from whatever definitions we have we discuss right now. So an insurance contract is a special contract. It's a contract of adhesion and has the elements of even a normal commercial contract where the insured seeks to alleviate his loss and get compensation. Now, a life insurance policy may be seen even as an investment and is considered as a co is considered also as a contract of adhesion since it has no it has no scope of bargaining or negotiation, but the insured is bound by the statutory policies, terms, and conditions that are mentioned in the policy contract. So an insurance contract establishes the relationship and agreement between the insured and the insurer, where the parties agree to abide by the terms, condition, and warranties expressed in the insurance contract. So therefore, the insurance contract, it actually acts as a protective risk device, which against the losses or damages that may be apprehended in the regular course of transaction or business or the utility of the subject matter. Next is what are the elements of an insurance contract or what makes the insurance contract different from the other contracts? Of course, the normal elements would be the general elements that are always available even in the other contracts. That is the general elements which has to be available in the concept of contract. One is general elements, and when we are trying to talk about insurance contract, there are specific elements that are, you know, that has to be, uh, you know, reflected in a valid insurance contract. So let us first understand what are the general elements there, which are the normal elements, which are available even also in the other contract, and which are, uh, you know, the elements which have to be there, there are significant elements that have to be there. One is offer, acceptance, valid consideration, capacity to contract, lawful object, lawful purpose. So thereby, there must be a valid offer that is acceptable to form an agreement. I'm sure you understand the concept of agreement and contract that you have already studied in the law of contract. Now, which agreement should be enforceable in nature? For an agreement to be considered enforceable, it must be made by parties competent to contract. The element of consensus ad idem or meeting of mind. What is consensus ad idem? There has to be meeting of minds and they are willing to pursue the terms and conditions of the particular contract. And both the parties are agreeing to abide by self, themselves by the covenants that are, you know, rep, uh, that are, uh, you know, reflected in the in the contract. So therefore, there has to be consensus added them that is meeting of minds. And there must be a valid consideration uh, that is an exchange for something, exchange of something that is consideration. And the purpose of the contract must be lawful. So consideration in an insurance contract is in the form of premium that is paid by the insurer to secure the policy. For example, A contracts would be to sell drugs to him. So this is, you know, drugs is, you know, an illegal business. It's not really, a, 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 you know, permitted by law. So this is not a valid contract. Why? The object of law is, you know, is the, the, the object of the dealing or the, the agreement between A and B itself is unlawful. So can such a, a such an agreement, uh, you know, can or such a dealing, can it be covered by an insurance? The simple answer is no, because in an insurance contract, even the, the object or the subject matter has to be lawful. So here, if you're trying to contract with B, of A tries to contract with B for the sale of drugs and apprehends some loss in transit, so he cannot really, uh, you know, procure a, 
insurance policy because any insurance policy which is um, against the where the subject matter is against the law, uh, uh, any insurer will not be in the position to insure such things because it's the, the object itself is unlawful. So apart from that, there are other special clauses that need to be there in an insurance contract, as you know, if insurance contracts or special contracts, indemnity contracts. The first thing is, of course, the indemnity clause. The, what it, the indemnity clause finds, finds its place in an insurance contract. Now, this is an essential clause in an insurance contract. All insurance contracts, except the life insurance policy, has an indemnity clause because personal insurance risks are not calculable. It really cannot be estimated. Thereby, life insurance contracts are not indemnity contracts. They do not have this clause except, uh, I mean, it's just life insurance policy. They do not have this indemnity clause, but all the other insurance contracts do have indemnity clause. Under this clause, the insurance company or the insurer covenants to make good the loss or compensate the loss or damage that is caused to the insured within the ambit or the scope of the policy. Next is the insured or the policyholder here must prove that there is an apprehension of loss, there's a fear of loss in case of occurrence of a contingent event sought to be covered, S-O-U-G-H-T there, there's a spelling error there, sought to be covered under the scope of the policy, S-O-U-G-H-T, sought to be covered under the scope of the policy. So the compensation that will be approved for disbursal by the insurer, the insurance company will be to the extent of the total amount of insurance policy obtained and indemnification cannot be more than the amount insured. So the indemnification, the, the, the seal of indemnification, indemnification would be to the extent of the amount of the policy. Now, if the insured gets more amount than the actual loss, the insurer, the insurance company is bestowed with the, the right to reclaim, the right to reclaim the additional amount disbursed back, to be disbursed back. Now, if the insured additionally receives a compensation amount from the third party after being fully indemnified by the insurer, the insurer will have the right to claim the additional amount that is received by the insured from the third party. So the next clause is a premium clause. The premium clause, of course, uh, it operates as, uh, you know, on the, on, on the consideration model. So it specifies the amount of premium that needs to be paid by the insured or the party who obtains the insurance policy here. And the premium once paid will not be refunded. However, there are certain exceptions wherein such an exception is mentioned in the policy. The next is the, uh, the concept of insurable interest, which we already discussed at length in one of your classes. So insurable interest is a nexus or the relationship of the insured. So a clause pertaining to insurable interest also has to find its place in a, in a valid insurance contract. It is a nexus of the relationship of the insured or the subject matter with the policy holder. So there must be an insurable in interest which is examined so as to process the policy or the claim. Next is the proximate cause. I mean, this is already discussed at length in one of the classes. So the cause of the loss must be proximate and not distant. So as to determine whether the cause of the loss is a peril that has been insured. Next is utmost good faith. This was discussed during the first class, the very first class, the first chapter of Uber, the concept of Uber and today. Here, an insurance contract is founded on the principle of absolute good faith, wherein the parties to the contract are obligated to disclose all the material facts pertaining to the contract and subject matter of the insurance, and no material fact must be withheld. Now, on this, I'm reminded of the law that is prevalent in the Sultanate of Oman, that when there is no good faith and uh, the parties do not contract in good faith, even an insurance contract can be terminated on that grounds. And this fact, especially of good faith, or, or uh, rather, if I put it this way, that a contract that is, uh, you know, that is uh, executed with bad faith would not be considered as a valid contract and even the insurance contract would be struck down. So uh, this is uh, this concept is prevalent even in the Sultanate of Oman precisely because this is what uh, like I just remembered and I wanted to let you know that of that as well. Next is limitation clause. Limitation clause that will specify the limit or the extent to which the insurance company will cover the loss. What is the exclusion clause? Of course, it would say the conditions or occurrences that the insurance company will not cover or compensate the loss. If you have any questions, you can ask me the end of the class 
or you can even let me know later if you have any questions pertaining to the slides. Next is warranty clause. What is warranty clause? Warranty is, uh, you know, it, it, the clause basically expresses certain conditions and promises in the insurance contract, which may be implied or even expressly stated. Next is the copay clause. Copay co clause. This clause basically finds place in a health insurance contract where the insured is expected to copay whole obtaining and, uh, you know, any medical service as for the terms that I mentioned in the health insurance policy contract and the percentage of co-payment may vary depending upon the type of health insurance. Now, assignment clause. Normally, there's an assignment clause even in general contracts and likewise, it's there even in an insurance contract. However, assignment clause, you know, in an insurance contract, or by under the uh, you know the normal insurance rules, it does not permit assignment of policy unless the insurance policy expressly permits it. Life insurance policies are assignable. However, for fire insurance policy, example, if the contract permits assignment, then the effect of assignment will lead to a new contract. So assignment is generally not permissible. So if they say it's non, it, you cannot assign it. It's non assignable. However, life insurance policy uh, contracts are assignable there. Next is subrogation clause. This um, this also we discussed at length what is the meaning of subrogation. So I'll just touch upon this aspect here saying that this clause has to be there in your insurance contract. So subrogation clause permits the insurance company to obtain recompensation from a third party who has caused the loss to the insured after compensating the loss of the insured. Next is the cooperation clause. The cooperation clause is a clause that seeks assurance from the insured party that the party would render all required assistance that may be required in case of investigation process in a claim. So the insured here is expected to divulge all relevant information, necessary reports, documentation that may be available to prove a legitimate claim and not procrastinate and not to delay the process and is expected to really cooperate so that, uh, you know, even the insurer will be able to perform his obligation and disperse the claim. Now, what is the procedure for filing insurance claim? Of course, the primary step is reporting the incident. For example, there is fire, you report it to the nearest police station, and then the police will come and you know assess the matter, investigate, and give you a report. So, for example, so this is a valid, this is a document that needs to be collected by you in order to help you to file a claim. So, of course, the primary step is reporting the incident to the nearest authoritative body or the police department in case of an accident-related policy, person claim, fire accident, etc. The police reports and all relevant investigation reports must be obtained by the insured. Now, the next step or is or the Samson a step that takes place is filing an application or claim with the insurance or the insurance company. And now here at this stage, fault or no fault is assessed at this stage. Now, upon what happens there now? Uh, and the, but what happens there in the insurance company? So what, what are the steps that are taking that side at their end? Now, upon receipt of the application, uh, you know, a claims adjuster will be delegated by the insurance company or he is going to act on behalf of the insurance company to investigate to claim the claim further. The claim adjuster may interview the claimant to the policy holder and any other witnesses and prepare relevant reports based on his or her study. So the claims adjuster will basically gather material evidence in the form of, say, example, medical evidence if the case requires so, or to carry out site inspections or gather information from the police or the other investigation officers, and then collect all these reports, collect the evidence, and then submit his report or her report, that is the claims adjuster report to the insurance company. Now, sometimes it's the it's, you know, it's carried down by depending on jurisdiction to jurisdiction and the type of company, the insurance company and so on. What is the, the internal policy of the company? They may have a claims adjuster, a, a distinct claim uh, adjuster and a distinct underwriter. Sometimes the, the, the task of a claims adjuster is performed by the underwriter themselves. So it depends. Now, next is in some cases, the claims adjuster plays a role of the underwriter. And then finally, a conclusion is drawn as to the legitimacy of the claim and accordingly calculate the compensation. Now, at this third Third stage, either the claim is approved. Now, you, the next stage is after all the material evidence is gathered by the insurance company through their through uh, the claims adjuster, the underwriter, underwriting team. At this 
third stage, either the claim is approved or rejected, or more information is sought. So either of the three happens, either it's approved, rejected, or more information is sought. Thereby, here at the third step, based on all the evidence that is collected, the insurance company may directly approve and calculatively disburse the amount. Now, if more information is sought, then the insured must comply with the request and provide all relevant information that is being sought. And both the parties are expected to, again, not procrastinate and act legitimately within the purview of the law and the policy of the contract. Now, conflict resolution, if any, in case of rejection or less amount approved, of course, now he's flabbergasted who the insured. So now in case of rejection or, you know, less amount is approved, that, that gives rise to a conflict because he has some other figure in mind. So in this case, what the insured would do, you can, even if he, uh, you know, senses the probability of injuries or damage assessment and the impact is being unfairly represented in, uh, in the insurance report or and then, uh, you know, the insured party may take recourse to, uh, to legal help. So this is what either he may handle it himself or he may, uh, you know, uh, take recourse of legal help or approach an insurance lawyer there. So further, in case the disbursal report is handed over to the insured and the insured party is dissatisfied with the claim, then the party can file an application highlighting the discrepancy and or dissatisfaction with the evidence. Next is court intervention. If the conflict is not resolved, the matter may or may not be resolved internally, but may grow into a dispute and a court's intervention may be needed here. If the conflict is resolved, then at the stage, a settlement agreement is drawn and the amount negotiated is released and disbursed to the insured. In case of a suit filed before the court, the proceedings would be initiated and the parties will have to await final judgment of decree and then the agreed party may file an appeal or move an application for execution of the decree. So normally what happens once there is a litigation and after that there is a judgment, long story short, what would you do with the judgment? So you'll have to find another application for execution of it or if the any of the agreed party, whoever it is, again, whom it is done, if they want to go in for an appeal, the party may take it further for an appeal. And there is a particular period there. And in case appeal, appeal period lapses, the other party can, you know, go ahead and file uh, an application for execution and then, you know, take the decree from there, the execution order, and then submit it to the insurance company. And then the insurance company would, uh, you know, uh, uh, would uh, disperse the claim. Next is it may happen that during the litigation, the parties may seek a compromise. It may happen in between, like, you know, in the court, the parties may seek a compromise and they may decide to close the matter by filing a settlement agreement that can be negotiated between the parties. So with the intervention of the court here, the settlement amount will be released to the petitioner or the insurer. They will drop a settlement agreement. Uh, you know, they will uh, submit it to the court. The court will approve it. And then the court will assign a date saying that on this particular date, you'll have to come and, you know, sorry uh you, may, you should come and you know uh, pay the amount in the form of check or whatever and then uh, give the proof to the court that the amount is being disbursed to do the to the party so it depends now so if there is a settlement when uh, even after a litigation so a settlement agreement may be drawn there so therefore the claims procedure it varies depending upon the type of insurance and a proposed the loss of damage that is caused and or of course the maturity of the policy and the you know the uh, this is how generally the procedures are across the globe but sometimes it it may vary a little bit here and there depending upon the you know the country or from country to country and from jurisdiction to jurisdiction but this is just a general overview in the international perspective and i've also given you the reference to different laws um, uh, at the beginning of this lecture like what what uh, how they conceive uh, uh, the policy of uh, how they conceive the, the concept of insurance and uh, how it really works like for example i give you an example of uae like what is the determining factor there and the concept of insurable interest which is given uh, you know primacy there is given primary importance and significance there and how in Oman, uh, you know, an insurance uh, or an insurance company or the insurer cannot really terminate the insurance policy right there or cannot terminate the contract unless there is a court intervention and an appropriate decree that is obtained from the court of law. So that's how we are studying in the international perspective. This is just a general overview in the international perspective of what is an insurance contract, the definitions of insurance contract, the elements of insurance contract and uh, how 
uh, a person can oh how the insurer uh, how the insured can file a claim and what happens during the the claim procedure this is just a brief overview just a brief overview in the international perspective i've just given you the points so that you know in a way in a perspicuous manner that you may really understand it next is defenses of the insurer what are the defenses of the insurance company now normally every company or oh, you know to be precise and to restrict ourselves to the subject an insurance company for that matter will always try to you know increase his profits and to you know cut off his liabilities so and try to you know the cost factor as well as the liability factor he'll always try to trim the liabilities and uh, you know trim the uh, trim his uh, you know his obligations to the best possible manner in a legitimate way. So what are the valid defenses in law that the insurance company can really come up with to either avoid a claim or to, to honor a claim, but with, or with a lesser amount than the claim amount that is actually mentioned in the application of claim. So the principles of contract law, of course, as you know, is applicable even in insurance contracts and the codes we need to understand are inclined to interpret insurance contracts as for the general principles of contract. Some of the defenses that are available for the insurer for denying or rejecting a claim are as follows. Denying, rejecting, or avoiding a lesser claim amount. One is invalid documents produced or misrepresentation, or in case even there is the element of fraud. So here it is point blank, rejection of a claim. Next is non-disclosure of vital information that was mandatory to be disclosed to decide on granting of insurance pol policy or concealment of relevant facts. And this has to also be studied in one of the uh, classes, uh, you know, sometime back, a, a few weeks back. So we already covered this concept. So you understand the disclosure of vital information by the insured is uh, of all material, vital information or immaterial information is a must. It is mandatory. So there, sh there shouldn't be any concealment of relevant facts. So in case there is concealment of relevant facts, so that would be a factor that would really hit uh, you know, matters of claim, and it would be an impediment for dispersal of insurance claim. Next is incontestability by virtue of incontestable clause is present sometimes in an insurance contract. In case there is incontestability clause there that one cannot really contest any you know amount that is disbursed or claimed. Suppose the, 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 the it, that's the reason even while you're signing an insurance contract, it's you know it's necessary that one goes through the terms and conditions and try to negotiate however in most jurisdictions uh you know as we discussed earlier insurance contracts or adhesion contracts and it does not give really much scope for uh you know for much scope for negotiation there so there can be an incontestability clause so it depends however in cases of incontestability clause then of course you know, this would be again one of the defenses, a valid defense that an insurer can raise before the court of law, or even when there is a, you know, the first level at the conflict level, they could come and, you know, come up with this clause as a defense and tell the insurer that by virtue of the incontestability clause, you can really not come and further negotiate. So this is it, and this is what the amount is finally that can be dispersed to you. Next is lack of coverage. Of course, it's beyond the subject matter or the scope of the insurance policy. And next is proximate cause is not really established in the case. So these are some of the defenses of the insurer. I believe the chapter is quite simple. I've tried my best to keep it as perspicuous as possible in an easy to understand manner. I wish and I believe that you already understood. However, if you have any questions, you can always ask me. You can, you know, feel free to ask me. So that's all, in fact, for today's class. That's all for today's class. Be mindful of the assignment that is already posted uh, in your Google Classroom. And uh, I'm sure I'm sure you're aware of uh, the negative marking there, that per day of default. I mean, you are expected to submit your assignments on time and you need to upload it in the Google Classroom in the, in the site. And uh, per day of default, there would be minus one or deduction of one mark per day of default. All the best and uh, meet you next class. Bye-bye.